Time to begin the meeting of the Metropolitan Council. It is Wednesday, July 10th, 2019. We call the meeting to order. Chair Slawick is out today, so I will be chairing the council meeting. Our first order of business is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion and a second to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Oh, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Next is the approval of the minutes. Uh, this would be the minutes from the June 26th meeting. Is there a motion and a second to approve the minutes? Move Post. approval. Is second. There a second. Great. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Next, we're going to move to the public invitation. We invite members of the public who wish to address the council on matters that are not on the agenda. We may do so at this time. Is there anyone here to address the council? Seeing no one, we will move on to the consent agenda. Can I have a motion in a second to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Seeing no. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We're going to move to the reports of the standing committees. Next is a report from the Environment Committee, Council Member Lindstrom. Thank you. The first item is uh, 2019 165 addresses master contracts for project communications and public involvement to support MCES's interceptor rehabilitation and improvements. So communication and outreach services are needed to implement the multi-year capital program for environmental services interceptor system and our treatment plants. Formal solicitation of bids was, was issued on January 16th, 2019. We received 10 proposals and uh, those were evaluated by <clears throat> environmental services and communication staff members. Based on the strengths and ability to provide communication needs, five master contracts were awarded and listed in the business item with corresponding award amounts. The Office of Equal Opportunity did not assign any disadvantaged business enterprise or underutilized business goal commitments for this procurement. Procurement staff contacted potential suppliers to make them aware of the solicitation one award was identified as a disadvantaged business enterprise, uh, women-owned business enterprise. Therefore, Madam Chair and members, I move that the Metropolitan Council authorize its regional administrator to award and execute Master Contract 18P381 for communications and engagement related to MCES capital projects to HDR Incorporated, uh, Zan Associates, Bolton and Mank, WSB and Associates, and Black and Betch, totaling $1.5 million. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have a report from the Management Committee. Council Member Ferguson. Oops. There's one more environment. I think I have one more on the list for me. <laughs> You're not, you're not done with me yet. <laughs> All right, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Business item 2019-192SW, excuse me, is a request to approve the 2019-2020 Water Efficiency Grant Program. This is super cool. Um, so I encourage you to listen closely on this one. So uh, point of use water efficiency upgrades. What we're talking about here is smart irriga irrigation controllers, low flow toilets, uh, things of that nature are critical strategy for efficiently using community water supplies, particularly for those water suppliers that, reply, that uh, rely on groundwater. The region's municipal water suppliers have expressed a need for financial incentives to help them implement rebate programs for end users, businesses, homeowners, whoever they may be, that will result in more efficient use of groundwater for growth and economic development. For fiscal years 2020 and 2021, the Met Council received an appropriation of $750,000 
by the state legislature from the Clean Water Fund to award water use efficiency grants to communities in the metro area. Grants will range from the low end of $2,000 to the high end of $50,000 to support the purchase and installation of water efficient products. The grant program structure, administration, funding, eligibility, application process, uh, proposed selection criteria and reporting requirements, as well as qualified activities are outlined in attachment A of the business item. This grant program has been endorsed by the Clean Water Council, the Metropolitan Area Water Supply Advisory Committee. Grant applications will be brought back to the Met Council for final approval prior to contracting. And therefore, Madam Chair and members, I move that the Metropolitan Council approve the process for 2020-2021 water efficiency grants described in Attachment A of the business item and authorizes staff to advertise the availability of grant funding and solicit applications for the, for the 2019 grants. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. All of Discussion? Yes, Council Member thank, thank you, Madam Chair. We did have some discussion at the meeting about the importance of actually getting the information out to cities so that they know to apply. And I just wanted to reinforce that. It came up again this morning at the Metro Cities Policy Committee meeting that when you have these things that come up somewhat suddenly and have a relatively short time frame to let people know about it and get their applications in, it's especially important that we reach out directly to like the water supply staff in the cities that are eligible for this and the city administrators and mayors, um, not in just a big newsletter that you hope they see that paragraph, but actually reach out directly specifically on this to make sure that everybody that is eligible knows about the program, has the opportunity to decide whether or not they want to participate so that we can maximize the availability of this to the, the cities that qualify to be a part of it. Okay. Any other discussion? Council Member Atlas Engelbitson. Um, Council Member Wolf, was there resolution to that or what, what or ideas that were shared or? or there, there were several ideas that were shared, but communication staff and, and uh, ES staff should have all of the contact information for the places that are eligible we just wanted to make sure that they know that don't just stick it in a newsletter reach out directly about this okay. madam chair i can uh, just build on to that um, so number one i'd encourage all of you to reach out to your mayors or council members city administrators absolutely no one is upset in, about getting an email saying that there's money available for your city right um, so that's a, uh, just a great opportunity for outreach and, and um, connecting with your communities. And then second, uh, we're gonna be reaching out to Green Step Cities. Uh, there's a listserv of Green Step City coordinators uh, that um, um, are involved in the Green Step Cities program. So that's another good way to do some outreach too. Excellent. Any other discussion, Council Member Johnson? Madam Chair, thank you. And just a quick follow-up. So. Does the Met Council have listservs with those very people on them so we can push things out quickly? Um, you know, segmented by need and department. Um, and, and I'm assuming Metro Cities is happy to put that information out. And then just lastly, I'm happy to push it out to my cities, but if we're all gonna be doing it, maybe somebody could just create a succinct email with a link or contact information so we can push it out all um, in rapid fire. Um, that's, that'd be my only questions and comments. Madam Chair? Great point. Mm. Kate Brickman is nodding as <laughs> that was <laughs> And Regional Administrator Vedas, did you have something to add? Uh, only that communications does in fact have those lists. Uh, they don't have every city staff member, but they certainly have uh, you know, public works directors and city administrators and those sorts of groupings and can handle that. And so uh, if I'm sure they'll include all of you, if you want to forward it again with a note on top, you're welcome to do that, but they certainly will hit those lists. Excellent. Yes, and then we're all giving the exact same consistent message tool, mm -hmm. which is really important. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion on this? Okay. Uh, there's a motion. Is there a second? 
for a second. 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 Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, motion carries, and I sure didn't mean to jump over the really cool <laughs> water efficiency <laughs> business item. I apologize for that. Next is the report from the Management Committee. Councilmember Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, business item 2019-155, Law Enforcement Labor Services Agreement with Local uh, 192 for part-time police officers. The Met Council's labor agreement with the Law Enforcement uh, Labor Services Local 192 expired on December 31st, 2017. The union represents 54 part-time officers who work for Metro Transit Police Department. The part-time force consists of officers licensed with other metro area agencies who augment their full-time police force for events and other critical service needs. The officers maintain their leave and insurance benefits with their home agencies. The union and, and the council reached a tenant agreement on June 3rd, 2019, which was ratified by the membership on June 13th, 2019. The union and the council previously agreed that the compensation of part-time officers should mirror that of full-time officers. Highlights of the agreement include a three-year contract effective January 1st, 2018 to December 31st, 2020, a 2.5 percent general wage increase each year of the contract for all eligible employees in the union. In the unit, the wage negotiated, the wages negotiated in this agreement are consistent with the settlements reached with the council's other labor unions. The cost of the agreement was viewed by finance and negotiated within the economic parameters established by the council. The item was reviewed and approved by the management committee on June 26, 2019. Uh, and I would just add one other comment because it was asked is that often the police union's labor agreements tend to be the last ones that we sign and as we go through our various labor agreements. So it's not unusual for this one to come up at this point in time. Madam Chair, the Management Committee moves approval to authorize the regional administrator to enter into a labor agreement with the Law Enforcement Labor Services Local 192 effective January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2020. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> Moving on is the Joint Report of Environment and Community <coughs> Development Committees. Council Member Lilligren. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Joint Committee Report is made up of three uh, cities' comprehensive plan and their comprehensive sewer plans. The first is the comprehensive plan for the city of New Brighton, it is business item 2019-147. Uh, the city is located in the northwestern part of Ramsey County and Thrive forecasts growth of 900 new households in the community through 2040. Uh, Th Thrive MSP 2040 designates New Brighton as urban. Council staff has found that the city's 2040 plan confirms to regional systems plans is consistent with council policies and is compatible with the plans of adjacent and affected jurisdictions. Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached advisory comments and review record and take the following actions. One, authorize the City of New Brighton to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect and to advise the city to implement the advisory comments and the review record for land use and water supply. And from the Environment Committee to approve the City of New Brighton's comprehensive sewer plan component of the city's 2040 comprehensive plan and to advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record of wastewater service. Thank you. There's a motion, is there a second? I'll second that one. Thank you. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> No discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next item is business item 2019-150. It is the comprehensive plan for the city of Bloomington. Uh, the city of Bloomington is located in the southeastern part of Hennepin County. Thrive MSP 2040 designates the city as urban. The plan includes revised forecasts agreed to by city and council staff. It is now forecasted that between 2017 and 2040, the city will increase by approximately 4,500 households, 7,000 people, and 22,000 jobs. City or council staff has found that the city's 2040 comprehensive plan conforms to regional systems plans, is consistent with council policies, 
and with the proposed forecast change and is compatible with the plans of adjacent and affected jurisdictions. Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached advisory comments and review record with the following actions from the CD Committee, authorize the City of Bloomington to place a 2040 comprehensive plan into effect, also revise the City's forecast upwards, uh, as shown in Table 1 of the attached review record, and revise the city's affordable housing need allocation to 842 units. From the Environment Committee, approve the City of Bloomington's comprehensive sewer plan. Once approved, the city shall submit to the council a copy of the final adopted ordinance that requires the disconnection of any identified prohibited discharges into the sanitary sewer system. Thank you. Uh, with that motion, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And finally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is business item 2019-151. It is the comprehensive uh, plan and review uh, file number 22095-1. You know, Madam Chair, I do apologize. I just want to just note that on the form, last item, the, the City of Bloomington Comprehensive Plan, we have been join, joined by Bloomington's lead staff. It's Julie Farm. I just wanted to note that she's here uh, uh, on this item today. So thank you for that. So thank back you for to, being here. Yeah, thank you. Back to the City of St. Louis Park. Uh, St. Louis Park is located in eastern Hennepin County. Uh, Thrive MSP 2040 designates the city as urban center. Uh, between 2020 and 2040, the city is forecasted to grow by 2,100 households and 3,300 jobs. Council staff found that the city's 2040 plan conforms to regional systems plans, is consistent with council policies with the proposed forecast change, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent and affected jurisdictions. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached advisory comments and review record along with the following actions from the Community Development Committee, authorize the City of St. Louis Park to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect, and also advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for surface water management forecasts and water supply. And from the Environment Committee, approve the City of St. Louis Park's comprehensive sewer plan and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for wastewater. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, moving on to other business, we have an appointment to the Land Use Advisory Committee, LUAC. On behalf of Chair Slawick, I recommend that April Graves be appointed to represent District 2 on our Land Use Advisory Committee. The Land Use Advisory Committee provides advice and assistance to the Council on Regional Land Use and Comprehensive Planning and in matters of metropolitan significance as requested by the Council. At least half of the members must be elected officials of local government units. April Graves is serving a second term on the Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Center City Council and has been liaison to the Parks and Recreation Commission, the Crime Prevention Commission, and the Brooklyn's Youth Council. She also has experience working in collaboration with developers and community members to plan and create spaces that feel welcoming, are safe, efficient, environmentally sustainable, and are accessible to all. I'd like to thank Council Members Wolf, Johnson, and Lindstrom for serving on the Land Use Advisory Committee nominating committee panel. Not only did they host interviews for District 2 candidates on June 19th, but they also helped fill all the vacancies for Districts 1 through 16 in March and April. Is there a motion to approve this four-year appointment to the Land Use Advisory Committee? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say, oh, excuse me, oh, Council Member Wolf. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. We had some fantastic mm -hmm. candidates for the position. Um, when we did the first round of interviews, we had only received one application for that uh, seat. So we went through with the other ones and held the, the application period open to give more people time to apply and had just an amazing slate of candidates. It was very hard to make a decision because they were so well qualified, but I think we'll be well represented in District 2. Excellent. Any other comments or discussion? And again, thank you to the committee for, it's a lot of time, it's a big commitment, so we appreciate the time that you put in. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
All right. Thank you, April, and congratulations. We look forward to working with you. Um, next up, we have an information item on the Metropolitan Airports Commission. Uh, Council Member Barbara, oh, welcome. <laughs> Just in time. Good timing. So, uh, Council Member Barbara will speak briefly about the Council's role with the MAC and introduce MAC Executive Director, CEO Brian Ricks, and MAC Vice President of Planning and Development, Bridget Reef. Council Member Barbara, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council Members, and a uh, very special thank you to MSP because I made it here on time because of the efficiency of being able to move through the airport. So uh, a good day to be able to come here and introduce this um, information item. So today we have Executive Director, Mr. Brian Ricks, and Vice President of Planning and Development, Ms. Um, Bridget Reef, um, are here to present an overview of the Metropolitan Airports Commission. The MAC and uh, Met Council have a good working relationship. We have a collaborative relationship. Uh, there is one MAC uh, Commissioner, Mr. Carl Crimmins, who serves on the Transportation Advisory Board, and then we have Council Member Ferguson, who also um, uh, uh, serves on the MAC Commission as a non-voting member. So there's good uh, discussion back and forth because obviously this has to do with overall transportation planning for the metropolitan area. Uh, the MAC Council reviews the MAC's annual capital improvement plan, as well as reviews environmental documentation at the regional airports, and provides for the input of long or provides input for the long-term um, comp plans at each airport. And so part of that, what we do is um, we do get an annual report from MAC here, so it gives a chance so we can see what's happening at um, at all of the airports across the region and a chance for us to ask questions and kind of learn about all of the great work that they were doing. So with that, I would welcome um, Brian and Bridget and look forward to your presentation. Welcome. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Okay, you're going to give that to me. You're going to let me drive. All right, <laughs> that's dangerous. Well, thank you very much. And <clears throat> Madam Chair, it's a, a pleasure to be here today. And, and Councillor Barbara, I'm really glad your flight got in and you were able to get here. Otherwise, it might not have been a very good <laughs> It was a great travel presentation. Day, I will so say. <laughs> happy to hear that. And, and also want to thank um, thank you for the appointment of uh, Councillor Ferguson uh, on our uh, board as the liaison. It's very important uh, for that connection, I think, as, as you mentioned, to continue to occur. I think we have a fantastic working relationship and look, look forward to uh, continuing that uh, partnership uh, with you and, and with the staff that have been uh, fantastic to, uh, to work with. So I'm going to give you kind of an overall uh, update here, and uh, please feel free to uh, interrupt me with uh, questions, or we can save them to the, to the end as, uh, as well. So we'll, uh, we'll start, I think. Do I need to point this at a certain... Or I can just hit the, uh, the enter button as well. Do we have a disconnect? Oh. Okay. All right. I'm looking at a picture of Hawaii on this. this <laughs> okay. I don't think that's going to work. Okay. It should work. So maybe I can pull the mouse, or actually, this will work. The clicker should work. Oh, it works for you. Did you just? Okay. All right. So. So anyhow, just, just kind of an introductory uh, slide. The Airports Commission was uh, established in 1943, so uh, celebrated our 75th anniversary a, a year ago, and, and really uh, for uh, three primary uh, purposes, really to promote the uh, efficient, safe, and economical air uh, commerce, to develop the full potentials of aviation in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, and minimize environmental impacts, and, and that, that's a big piece of, of what our challenge is. Obviously, with an airport, uh, the, the, one of the greatest uh, environmental impacts is the noise. And we've invested, similar to uh, other large hub airports who have invested in noise mitigation, I think we've invested more than any other large hub airport in the country, uh, uh, out of $500 million in our current noise mitigation uh, process. And so we take that very, very seriously. We can, the legislation allows us to own airports within 35 miles of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, and we're funded by uh, rents and fees. It's really a user fee approach. We, we treat it, we operate as a business. We don't uh, take in any taxpayer dollars, even though the legislation allows us to do that. 
um, but we haven't done that since the early 60s, I think when the original terminal was uh, constructed, and we have no intention of uh, ever going back there, uh, obviously, if we don't, uh, we don't have to. But I, I look at this, and, and you look at the foresight of the governor at the time and the legislature at the time to create a autonomous uh, organization that really focused so solely on uh, running and operating our airports in the area, and I think it, it was just a fantastic uh, model, and it works. Uh, it works very uh, well. Our mission is connecting you to your world, and our vision is is providing your best airport experience. We'll talk more about that because we take that very, very seriously, and uh, and I think we receive some nice accolades that really reflect on how seriously we take that. As you know, uh, a seven airport uh, system. Uh, the system was designed so that Minneapolis was really the, the focal point for a scheduled air service and scheduled cargo uh, traffic, and that the, the other airports would really be designed to accommodate general aviation and corporate uh, type of aircraft so that we can have as much capacity <laughs> for scheduled air service and cargo types of traffic at uh, Minneapolis. And it works well. It works really well. And I think the best testament that we've had over the last couple of years, actually a couple of times, was the Super Bowl in 2018 when over 1,100 uh, private and corporate aircraft descended upon Twin Cities area. And there was about 350, a uh, little less than 350 of those that, that did park at MSP. The rest were at um, a Flying Cloud, Anoka, and downtown St. Paul. And I don't know if you saw any of the, the pictures during that time of those corporate aircraft. We actually closed runways that didn't need to be used and parked corporate aircraft on those uh, runways. So it works really well. Uh, when you look at, on an average day, there's about 2,000 landings and takeoffs throughout the system. About 1,150 of those are at Minneapolis. Uh, the rest, about 850, are throughout the River Airport system. And that number is actually down. Um, Minneapolis, we had a high of uh, over 1,500 takeoff and landings per day back in 2005. And so that number has actually reduced. Passenger numbers are, have gone up. We've set records, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the reason for that is a lot of smaller, remember, a lot of prop aircraft used to fly between some of the outstate communities um, in the five-state region. Uh, those are all now at least 50-seat regional jets. They used to be nine you know, you know, 12, 15, 32 seat aircraft. And so the trend has been increasing the size of aircraft, which has resulted in less takeoffs and landings, which from a capacity standpoint bodes well. Uh, we've, we've got opportunity to continue to, to grow from a, from a capacity standpoint. Uh, we have about 650 employees at the, at the MAC. Um, you know, we operate kind of like a, a city with our own police, our own fire, uh, a dispatch, planning, development, and environment. They, they should have recognized uh, Bridget, who is in that role as our vice president, uh, just less than two years, about two years uh, now. And I know you've seen a lot of her. Or she's, she's the main face of our organization here and does a great job for it. So uh, planning, uh, development, our maintenance department, our, our maintenance guys plow the uh, runways in the wintertime. They mow the grass, change the light bulbs, um, and, and really do a great job of maintaining uh, these facilities. And it's, uh, it's a big job and uh, unique. It's a unique environment, obviously. A little bit from a financial standpoint, we generate about $381 million in annual revenues. Uh, you know, about a third of that is airline rates and charges. Uh, again, you land there, you pay a landing fee, uh, charge the airlines for the gates that they occupy, the ticket counters, uh, all of that. Uh, parking and ground transportation is also a big part of our, our revenue, about a third of that as well. A concession, so if you, again, do business at the airport or you operate a concession, you pay us a, a concession fee, whether it's a rental car, or a food and beverage, or news or retail. Outlet. So that's that's the revenue stream, about $198 million in expenditures on an annual basis, or in 2019, about uh, just under half of that is personnel, uh, maintenance, about 20% of that, um, operating services expenses. If we, in, you know, some of the things we do, though, if we can contract services out, we typically, and, and lower our overhead costs, we will typically do that. A good example of that is cleaning services. Uh, 
working at contract services clean air terminal, some contract security services as, as well. So uh, it's, a, it's a combination of full-time staff and, and contract uh, contract staff to uh, make up that $198 million. So it looks like we're making a, a lot of money, but that money is really invested back in to support all of the capital improvements that, uh, that we do. So when you Take the 381 million in revenues. You subtract the almost 200 dollars or 200 million in operating expenses. You have net operating revenues of about 182 million, and then we have non-operating expenses of 122 million dollars, 123 million dollars annually. The majority of that is our debt sir annual debt service payment of about 110 million dollars annually on about currently 1.4 billion dollars in debt. So. We issue airport revenue bonds. We pay those bonds back through the revenue that we generate at the facility. That leaves about uh, you know, almost $60 million in net revenues. Those net revenues are then invested back into support, typically capital improvement projects at Minneapolis or throughout our system with airports. So uh, that's, that's how our financing uh, picture works. Uh, we take a very conservative approach, uh, recognize for that. Uh, uh, with our our largest um, tenant, Delta Airlines. They appreciate that. Uh, we want to maintain a very competitive cost structure because that allows us to then be competitive to bring new air service into the market. Uh, we maintain a six-month reserve, and we have the best uh, bond rating of any airport. There's about a handful of airports that share that uh, AA minus bond. You may ask, why isn't, triple, why isn't it a AAA plus? Um, it's because... Uh, we are at the mercy of airlines and big airlines that are hubbed in you know, Delta, Sun Country that are hubbed there. But uh, again, um, uh, that's why that rating isn't uh, isn't any higher, and that's typical in the airport industry. A little bit about passenger levels. I mentioned uh, the last two years have been record uh, passenger years for us, just over 38 million uh, passengers. The previous record was back in uh, 2005, but we've been on kind of a, a, a nice uh, trend here. Uh, the thing about, as you know, about the Twin Cities area, diverse economy, and so we don't see any real big dips like some other airports around the country see, so it's a pretty, um, it's pretty gradual. Um, this year, we're up, I think, uh, 2 to 3%, so we may make it another record this year. Uh, where does that rank us? It ranks us 17th in the country from... Um, from a passenger standpoint, as far as the largest hub airports in the country, just uh, just uh, kind of right on par with Boston and ahead of Detroit. I like to stay ahead of Detroit because that's another Delta hub, as you know, and so we want to uh, want to maintain that uh, that competitive advantage. Speaking of air service, we've had really fantastic uh, news on air service over the last uh, two to three years. Eleven airlines have added forty-five additional routes since January of 2017. And the more important thing is that uh, we now enjoy competitive air service on 57 of our total 167 uh, direct uh, A lot of that air service growth has been um, low cost, Southwest Airlines, Alaska Airlines, ultra low cost airlines, Spirit. The Sun Country is now transitioning to an ultra low cost uh, carrier. A lot of that growth has been uh, through those types of carriers, which um, has meant a couple of things. Uh, one, airfares have dropped 18% since 2013, so that's a, a good thing for consumers. When airfares drop, it stimulates air travel, and there's more demand, and it gives us additional opportunity to go after uh, additional uh, additional routes. So that's uh, that's been a, a really a positive impact. Uh, one of the challenges with the air service that we are um, experiencing is that air service, the low cost, the ultra low cost, is not connecting traffic. It's, for the most part, origination and destination, meaning people are either starting their, their uh, trip here or they're ending it here, which puts more pressure on the front of the house, on our terminal facilities, on our baggage claim, on our ticketing facilities, on security uh, screening. So that's the, the challenge, and I'll talk about how we're uh, addressing some of I mentioned uh, Sun Country. Um, uh, they added eight uh, new additions. They, they uh, advertised this or announced this in January of this year. Those cities have, have all been added. 
and um, with the transition from a low cost to an ultra low cost carrier, you're seeing uh, changes uh, with uh, Sun Country. They're charging, maybe charging more for certain things that you may want that they didn't previously charge for. But the other thing they're doing is they are experimenting. Just this just started this year with connecting passengers from the East Coast to the West Coast and vice versa through Terminal 2 at Minneapolis. So they've never done this before. Traditionally, Sun Country has been a north to south operation primarily. We all want to go south in the, in the wintertime, right? And then we come back uh, north. But they're really focusing in those eight cities they added were really focal uh, from a, an East Coast standpoint for the most part to start this connecting activity. Uh, we're seeing um, some pretty um, from a percentage wise some pretty significant increases in sun country traffic right now so we'll watch that carefully um, as we as we go you probably heard a little bit about some of the international announcements it's been a great year i don't know if we've ever had three major international announcements uh, before uh, but delta started uh, seoul uh, service on april 1st the seoul service goes through a joint venture with korean air at incheon airport I had an opportunity to travel through there um, uh, just the week after um, this uh, this opened. Well, I actually had to go a few days before this service started. It took me, I had to go to Detroit, to Seoul, and then I was I was destined for Hong Kong, but it took me, I, I don't know, 22 or 23 hours total trip time. <coughs> Coming back, I was able to take the flight from Hong Kong to Seoul and then direct to Minneapolis. It, just, it shaved, I think, six or seven hours off my travel time. So fantastic, uh, fantastic air service. You can connect to 80 other destinations in Seoul. And the Incheon Airport is fantastic. I mean, break about our airport, this airport is fantastic as, as well. So if you have that opportunity, I, I, you'll really enjoy that connecting opportunity. Uh, also, uh, not too long afterwards, June 8th, uh, Delta announced Mexico City service. Um, this is fantastic. Again, they have a uh, agreement with Aero Mexico and allows you to, to uh, connect to over 40 different destinations through Mexico uh, City. And that's a, obviously a very important a trade a partner for us in, in Minnesota and something uh, certainly uh, well. And then just last week, uh, we cut the ribbon on new nonstop service to Dublin with a new international flag carrier, Aer Lingus. Aer Lingus is not um, uh, from a pricing standpoint, they're kind of in the middle between low cost and a uh, full service uh, carrier. But I did have an opportunity to, to fly on them as, as well when they made the announcement in Dublin um, uh, about a year ago. And it is fantastic service. So uh, great uh, announcements that we had recently. And then we're hoping uh, that uh, we'll have Delta service nonstop to Shanghai next year. Delta applied for a slot that American is not using. American has, we just heard a couple of weeks ago, American has given those uh, slots up. So we think our chances are very good having that nonstop, nonstop service to Shanghai. So, so between Seoul, Shanghai, it's great additions uh, to, to Asia. And something we certainly needed. Uh, we were short on the really primary way to get there before was going to Detroit. I mean, we've had Narita and Haneda service for, for a long time, but that was really uh, ab about it. So good news on this well. All in all, when you look at the total air service portfolio, 17 carriers providing service, it's a good portfolio because you have the full service carriers like the Deltas and the Americans and Uniteds. You have low cost carriers, Southwest, uh, Alaska, you have ultra low cost carrier, Spirit, Frontier, and now Sun Country. So it really covers the full uh, realm. So it's, I mentioned, I should have looked at Blue too, it's, which, which has been just an addition in the last couple of years. So fantastic, uh, fantastic service. So one of the reasons I touched on this a little bit, one of the reasons we've been able to be successful from an air service development standpoint is our costs for a plane passenger are low. This is a metric that the airlines look at very closely. Um, when you can stack us up against the 30 major hub airports, our cost per plane passenger, and this is a metric where you, you add up all the costs across airlines to operate the airport, you divide it by the passengers, and you come up with a number of $6.50. We are in the bottom quarter of your hub airports, and that's a good place for us to be. We're committed to staying 
in that area, and, and it helps us. Uh, it helps us um, uh, promote uh, our airport and our region to uh, carriers. The other thing we started um, in 2017 was uh, is, is an, a joint collaboration between the Metropolitan Airports Commission and Greater MSP called the Regional Air Services Partnership. What we wanted to do is bring businesses to the table to help us develop air service opportunities. And, and primarily, I'll say primarily focused on international, first and foremost, but we're getting good information from a domestic standpoint that I think is going to further our cause in those areas as, as well. But what this does, um, and I'll, ba I'll back up by saying, as an airport, we know where people are going and coming, going to and coming from today. We've got all that data. We get it from the US DOT. We get it six months in the, in the rears, so it's not current data. But what we didn't know is where businesses are going to be going, you know, a year out to three years out to five years out. And so we created this collaboration so that and we called the CEOs of these companies and said, we need this information to help us drive additional air service uh, routes. Uh, worked through Greater MSP, they created a survey they sent a survey out, we've now done two of these, and uh, we take this information, we bring it to the airlines, and the airlines um, have responded with uh, these international air service announcements. The feedback we've got from Delta and other airlines is we've never seen a community do this before. This is great. Keep, keep doing it. And so it's a great, I think, collaborative partnership where we've really been able to take air service development to the, to the next Madam Chair. level. Oh, yes, Councilman Hi, Johnson. May day job is greater MSP. Oh, sure. And we are so grateful for your leadership. And this partnership really works because, again, you guys are experts at what you do. The airlines are experts at what they do. <clears throat> but what greater MSP can bring to this is we can go under NDA with those businesses so that they're not giving away trade secrets or information that they would not otherwise provide. And without your leadership, none of that would happen. So we're just so thrilled to have you leading the MAC and, and this wonderful collaborative spirit, and it really has such a positive impact on our economy and sets us apart on many different levels. So thanks, Brian. Thank you. Um, appreciate that a lot. Appreciate that. And, and it is, to, to her point, if we get information, it's public. It's public information. So that's the key with greater MSP is mm -hmm. their connection to the business community and the ability to keep information that they don't, that they need to keep confidential, confidential. Move into MSP Reimagined, which is really our $1.6 billion development program that we're currently under. It started back in 2015, late 2015, and runs through about 2023. Uh, a piece of that was the Intercontinental Hotel, which is a fantastic public-private partnership between the Airports Commission and Graves Hospitality. Uh, Graves uh, built the hotel, spent about $80 million on it, did a fantastic job. This, this is a tremendous asset. I get so many compliments from people that travel through and stay at this facility. They did it right, which is great. We invested about $20 million in infrastructure to support that uh, facility and also built the Skyway over the Concourse uh, C. So that's been a great addition. They also have about 30,000 square feet of being event space. Uh, it's, the reviews are good for companies that want to just fly people in for a day, do depositions or have an event, and then send them back out um, that night or the, or the next day. So it's, uh, it's been a really positive, uh, positive addition to our facilities. Uh, in 2015, 2016, we started a complete redevelopment of all of our concessions, bringing 80 new concession opportunities into the, into the facility, uh, not only restaurants, but retail and <coughs> news uh, opportunities. The goal was to bring local flavor into the airport. When people come through here for the first time, or whether it's the first or second or third time, or whatever, we want them to get a sense of what Minnesota and the Twin Cities region is all about. I think we've really been able to do that through bringing in so many local venues. You do need national chains as well because you have you have uh, parents, <coughs> small children that want to eat at McDonald's or or somewhere else that is uh, very affordable. Uh, but this has been a fantastic story. So we're in the second phase of this process right now. That phase will wrap up at the end of this, this year, and, um, and it'll be just a, a great uh, end state uh, as we move forward. Madam Chair. <clears throat> yes, Council Member Chambliss. Um, yeah, going back to the introduction of the new restaurants and shops, I, I mean, I've been in Minnesota all my life, so I've seen the 
the transgression to more of, of the retail and also the local shops in there. And actually, um, sometimes I want to go back and shop some more after my trip. So that, that speaks well to um, who you're attracting. Can you talk about what phase two includes? Yeah, phase, uh, let me see if I can back up. Phase two includes some of these things that we've seen here. So phase two, probably the biggest piece of phase two is an expansion of our mall area concession. Uh, if you recall, uh, as you go through that center mall, there's an area you can kind of go back to behind the scenes. That is, be, how many square feet are we adding to that? It's pretty significant. But we've added a tremendous amount of square feet to that and included a lounge, bar and lounge area in there. And, and so that's probably the most significant piece. A Blue Door Pub was part of the, the second phase. Um, High Low Diner, all of these, I think, yeah, Starbucks, all of these that you see were part of the, the second phase. And um, uh, Butcher and the Boar. Uh, the Cook in the Ox. The Cook in the Ox. So the, the, the individual who runs a Butcher and the Boar downtown is uh, doing the Cook in the Ox. That'll be the, the high end and a steakhouse area. That would be where Ike's formerly was. So um, so those are some of the new ones that you'll see when you get there. And again, it, it'll be finished. Uh, <coughs> Can I ask a quick follow up on that? Um, I was hearing a discussion on the radio actually last week about whether there might ever be an opportunity because it is a spectacular airport and the shops and the dining mm -hmm. and so forth, an opportunity for people to come and eat and shop who are not traveling. Sure. It's interesting because there are some airports that are starting to experiment with that. Pittsburgh is one. There was another one that, uh, is it Tampa? I think Tampa was another one that just recently started a program to do that. And and the the only challenge with that is you got to get people through security. Okay. And um, in, in our case, uh, we would need to determine the low times during the day to allow that to happen because we, we don't want to bring in additional volume during some of those peak times. But it's I know it's something that our former chair, Chair Bovin, was interested in, in exploring and, and we've, we have talked to TSA a little bit about it. They've pushed back because of the volume of the, of the checkpoints, but it's something that I, I think eventually we'll, we'll take a closer look at. Good, good question. Um, so, one of the major improvements, also phased improvements that is going, uh, again, started in 2016, will go through about 2022, maybe into 2023, is something we call operational improvements. And this is, we're actually adding 15 feet to the front of the terminal, terminal one along the entire uh, length. And that, uh, again, that will be complete by 2022. But really the, the idea is a complete remodeling or not the idea, it will be a complete remodeling of the ticketing area, the baggage area, and the vertical circulation element. So we opened the first phase of this just prior to Super Bowl, and that additional square footage we had uh, was wonderful, and we put about 62,000 people through security screening the day after the, the big game. Um, but um, again, natural uh, more natural light will be involved in these spaces. As you know, our baggage claim is kind of a dark and dingy area. It's going to be lightened up. We're raising the roof as much as we can down there, completely redoing baggage, uh, the baggage claim carousels to add additional capacity. Um, elevators and escalators are being re realigned instead of going up this way and causing a bottleneck because what happens as people would go up, they would look both ways and they would stand there and you would create congestion. Now we've got elevators and es escalators going each direction so that individuals can go in each direction and a central bank of elevators uh, that will go uh, straight up between the uh, levels. The goal here is to create a consistent experience all the way through the facility, whether it's from your, your vehicle at the curb to the gate or vice versa. And uh, this project will certainly do that. We're going to have, uh, I think, what would be the largest public art uh, uh, display. Uh, there'll be a hole cut between the two levels, and so it's going to be a wonderful, uh, wonderful addition. Again, from a first impression standpoint, uh, to our, to our region. Uh, we're also building a 5,000 uh, space parking ramp with an auto rental and transit facility in it that will be complete in 2020. We run out of parking typically on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Of, uh, during certain periods. This will solve that problem. Um, 
and, uh, and so we're looking forward to having that uh, project complete here uh, in just uh, just about a year. Uh, one of the things, one of our big challenges is congestion at our curb front, especially given all of this construction activity. Uh, one way to help alleviate that is Delta opened a new passenger check-in on the east side curb front. So we've got kind of two roadways that go. This is on the, as you're coming up, the left-hand roadway. So we think that will help relieve some of that uh, congestion as uh, well. Just, this just gives you a little bit of a picture um, in this area. And this is the, that building in the middle is the U.S. Post Office. Just to the left of that is our old parking plaza that you would go through and pay for parking. To the right of that post office is where the hotel is now. A little bit further right is where our new parking plaza. So I'll just give you a sense of how that area has changed in the last uh, two and a half, three years. So again, hotel there with the Skyway over uh, to Concourse C, the new exit plaza to the right, and the, the parking ramp being constructed just to the left of the post office. The, the plan here with the hotel, you can see that Skyway, is that uh, to your bottom left is the end of Concourse G. We have the ability to expand that concourse uh, further to the east, and if we ever do that, we can extend that Skyway so that passengers will have access to Concourse G as well. A uh, little bit about reliever airports. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go through each one. Air Lake Airport, about 33,000 landings and takeoffs, 142 based aircraft. We're doing some work uh, there. We're extending both runway ends uh, slightly. Um, uh, we've, um, Lakeville has recently annexed the area from Eureka Township, so that's been a positive, um, a positive development uh, for us that allows us to now build out, get utilities and build out uh, that area to the south in yellow, which is a, which is a really a dedicated for additional hangers. Uh, Anoka County Blaine, about 75,000 landings and takeoffs annu annually, 381 based aircraft, so it's a, a busy, very busy, one of our busiest uh, airports. Uh, longest runway is 5,000 uh, feet. We've got a, a control tower there as well. Crystal Airport, we're doing, and I know you've approved the long-term comp plan uh, for that. Thank you uh, for that, but we're we're, I would say what we're doing there is right-sizing the airport for the demand. Uh, uh, it, it has currently parallel runways. We're going to take one of those runways out and create a taxiway. Um, we're um, and, and, and then going to do a little uh, bit of an extension uh, on the runway, or really not an extension, but it's just using more of the usable space for the runway to, to uh, add a, a little bit uh, additional distance to it and shifting our runway protection zone so that they're on airport uh, property, which, which we think is, is very important. Flying Cloud, busiest reliever airport, 89,000 landing takeoffs annually, 364 based aircraft. I really know uh, we're uh, scheduled there in the near, near term. That also has a, a control tower. Uh, Lake Elmo Airport, 32,000 uh, landings and takeoffs, 189 based aircraft. Uh, as you may or may not know, um, we're doing some work there. We're realigning the runway. We're not changing the type of aircraft that are going to be serving that runway. These are all in the in the in the really mind of safety to make that airport as safe as it as it uh, possibly can. Uh, we're adding about 600 uh, feet to the to the runway when that's being realigned. The old runway will be a will be a taxiway. And then St. Paul Downtown Airport, obviously. 90 based aircraft, a lot of corporate aircraft um, uh, use that facility, about the 6,500 foot uh, runway, which is good for those size, uh, those size aircraft, and, and a great airport when you ski events uh, downtown. From an economic standpoint, about 16 billion total economic impact uh, the airport produces. This is a report from 2017, about 87,000 jobs associated with with uh, related to the airport operation, 973 million in, in taxes. Our general, our reliever airports generate about three quarters of a billion uh, in economic impact as well, and 400,000 uh, direct jobs. A uh, little bit, uh, you know, a little bit to brag about some of the things they do. Hmm. We'll, we'll just we'll just, we'll just, we'll just, just I go. I believe it will. Let's see, no, it doesn't. Let me see if I can. And that, well, I wonder. Will that work on there or not? This was a video to kind of to kind of brag about our snow removal guys, and and uh, I, I like the to. The cursor doesn't work, does it? 
I don't think so, but we can we can record the video. I think that's it was it. Oh, where's that? <laughs> <laughs> I want to go there. There's no so removal guys of that. that. Yeah. Great job. Before and after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's kind of a transition from the other <laughs> one. Yeah. I think Greg's doing it. There you go. That, he? Greg's got it in the back, probably. How did you get that? See if, yeah, can you get move the cursor over there and start? Is it, I, I'm not sure what happened between the beginning and the middle of the And how it's set it up, set up now. Close your, close the iPad. Oh well, we can, um, yeah, we can, we can share this with your, or if uh, there's an opportunity to watch. I think we might have one other video in here that, as well. But a little bit about uh, awards. We've really received some great awards. Uh, best airport concessions program in North America. And this is, these are just recent best airport retail program in North America. Best new national brand concept. Best green concession concept. Uh, practice um, and, and best airport food and beverage uh, offer for the American region. Um, and, and so great awards on our concession program. Uh, really, um, there's also a, a world um, airport award program through Airports Council International. These awards are uh, based on uh, surveys that are actually done for departing passengers on 34 different key areas from your parking and your uh, ticketing experience from your security screening uh, uh, experience and then won the award uh, for an airport between 25 and 40 million passengers for the last three years. Uh, so proud of that. We've also uh, taken home the most efficient airport in North America through the Airport uh, Air Transport Research Society. And, uh, the great awards. This was another video I was hoping to show. It kind of really dedicates the, these awards to the personnel that yeah, work there. You gonna try? Okay, that work there um, day in and day out. So we have we have um, I mentioned about 650 employees at the MAC. There's about 21,000 employees that work throughout the airport. Airlines, the concession workers, and as you know, it's a very diverse uh, workforce. Uh, we've been working with with you, I think, on improving service, bus service, and opportunities for employees to get there because that's extremely important. So, um, but all those employees do just a fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> I should have mentioned with that too is we have an airport foundation so one of the kind they be aware of this but they are the volunteers 450 volunteers many retired individuals that still want to be active and they come out there and just do a phenomenal job of providing a direction and service and providing that personal touch to our to our customers and that's really what's uh, what's important so all right let's try this one or can you yeah it'll work Record snowfall. I, I should have mentioned too. We won the Balkan Post Award 
which is the highest award given to any airport for snow removal operations. So, so the good news is we won it. Whenever you win it, though, you know you had a terrible winter. So I, 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 I'm schizophrenic about that. But it's a tremendous runway lights and a plow that opens and closes as you go around these lights and then sweeps the snow away from you. So. We used to have to hand shovel around all 7,000 yeah. lights. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. Anyhow. So that's that's the extent of it. Again, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come down here. And if there's any other questions, I'm happy to. Great presentation. Questions? Yeah, that was awesome. Council Member Lee. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I like the idea of a. Um, Convening the business folks to ask about where we could uh, have more direct routes to. I wonder if you could, um, maybe as a suggestion, do something similar for constituent groups or just travelers who live here as residents. For example, in the Twin Cities, we have the largest moan community in the United States. Mm -hmm. I bet if you do a direct flight to Bangkok, you'll make a million dollars overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, we're... we're we're thinking about that. We're working on that, and uh, so there's there's a number. We have a we have a good list of opportunities, and um, and that certainly is one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, there. Yes, um, I've, I've got a comment and then a question. Um, uh, I've worked for four different contractors at MSP doing electrical work uh, over my career. I I feel like MSP uh, is my, the airport is my home. Uh, I know that's where I would be working if I wasn't in the job that I'm at now. I just, uh, I just want to say, if you you want to shop at the airport, being an employee there is a great way to do that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, so, and I'm also aware of some of the policies around the airport. Um, uh, could you explain to the council, because I think there's a presentation coming on up uh, later on project labor agreements and how they've been helpful uh, in completing the projects at MSP. Sure, a absolutely. So we, we spent a lot of uh, time on that, obviously, uh, and, and Chair, uh, Madam Chair, and Mr. Zern. Um, we've got a long history of doing project labor uh, agreements, and we really look at at projects, and I, I should have Bridget respond because this is this is her area. But really, have look at projects that we want to ensure uh, do not end up in disrupting, that are uh, very time sensitive, sensitive from a completion standpoint, and don't uh, have a negative impact to a strike of disrupting passenger flow or or movement. So, typically, what we do is we look at a, our list of projects every year. Uh, we identify those projects that we think are good for project labor agreements. We meet with the trades organizations and the, and the unions, and we talk about it. We come to an agreement. We bring it before our, our commission, and they and they typically bless uh, those agreements. And then we move forward and initiate those project labor agreements uh, before um, before we even go out to, to to bid on. So it's a, it's a really good way to ensure that we don't uh, that obviously we involve. Uh, the trade organizations in uh, uh, understanding uh, projects coming forward and, and ensuring that there's no disruption. Would you add anything to that? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, mm -hmm. the item that we have coming up on a future agenda just relates to um, the idea that we'd actually put the criteria that we use into an actual formal policy. There's a desire to do that, to put a little bit of more, a little bit more formality around. Um, how we choose which projects we use. And so as you see items on our upcoming agenda, that's what that would be associated with. Thank you. Councilmember Lindstrom. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm hoping that you can comment a bit on the large solar project that you completed a few years ago. I, my understanding, it's about a two megawatt solar array on top of your 
parking structure and that you combined putting in <clears throat> hundreds if not thousands of LED lights with a quicker payback uh, with the solar array that has a longer payback the, to help make those make that project work and I'm just curious to know uh, how's it working uh, madam chair and counselor uh, Lindstrom, it's my understanding is working very well I mean I think it's it's exceeding our projections 2.4 megawatts no we're actually over four when you include wow. you including Nine together yeah because we both we we have one at terminal one and then also one at, at terminal two so, so it's over both 3.1 <clears throat> megs for the one system at terminal one and then an, another meg at least at terminal two and, and you are correct they are um, absorbing more energy than we estimated they were <laughs> so it's been a very a very positive story and you are correct too that we did uh, replace the parking ramp lighting in its entirety with LED lights that helped balance the equation and the cost for doing it because it had a quite an escalated cost. We had to build an actual structure for the panels to sit on for each of our ramps. And so that's how the dollars ended up working out. The ramp that we're currently building is being constructed with LED. So that offset won't be available as part of an, a solar equation. The ramp is being constructed so that it can support that type of development if we choose to do that in the future. Council Member. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's a great model for other airports. Some people think airports and solar panels don't mix, uh, but clearly you are showing otherwise and can be a great model for businesses and local governments as well. Shifting gears just a little bit, I'm wondering about the Blaine, Anoka Blaine Airport and um, any uh, Long-term plans for that airport. I know the um, runway extension has been a, a, a topic in the past. Uh, any other, any any comments on that, or any other sort of uh, uh, plans for that airport in the next few years? Madam sure. Chair and, and uh, Councilor, uh, so we're limited from a runway extension standpoint. We're limited by uh, state legislature. Uh, we cannot construct a runway beyond 5,000 feet. Uh, at our, any of our relief airports without legislative approval. So that's, um, th so that's the reason those runways are not beyond that. Um, trying to think additional, um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of a space up there, uh, additional development that are, is identified right now. So Madam Chair and Council Members, um, right now what we're doing is actually, um, we're doing a planning study of our three larger reliever airports, so St. Paul downtown, Noka County Blaine and Flying Cloud. Airport Flying Cloud is also limited to a 5,000 foot runway. Um, but the three airports operate um, as part of our system and have amenities that um, could be shared, for example. And so there may be desire for a longer runway at Anoka, but can St. Paul provide that need instead of trying to go down that route at Anoka? And similarly with Flying Cloud, are there amenities that can be shared or do we need to have it? That's what we're looking at right now. And then that'll feed into an individual airport long-term plan uh, for each of them. So right now on the books, we're continuing to show ultimately four runways at the Anoka County Blaine Airport um, and additional hangar areas. Um, my guess is our study will come back and indicate that we don't need that type of runway system there. Um, and eventually though, we would probably need the hangar space, but that's yet to be determined. Just a quick follow up, Madam Chair. What, what's the timing for that, uh, that study? So Madam Chair and Council Members, we're working on the study right now. We're hoping to wrap it up next year and then the individual airport plans would be a 2020 to 2040 type of time frame associated with them. But keep in mind, we, we have a staff of one in our <laughs> planning department and um, our focus right now is uh, our MSP long-term plan. So we wanna get a 2040 plan prepared for that and then we're also um, for a number of our airports looking at uh, implementing state airport zoning which is also a, a planning um, responsibility so we have lots to do but ideally the initial study would get done in 2020. Thank you. Councilmember Gonzalez did you have your hand up? Yes thank Fair you. Enough. Thanks Madam Chair. Um, just following up on some of your comments about the capacity um, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, that the airlines are moving away from the smaller planes. Now they're uh, using the Embraers and Airbus and, and Boeings for the larger size. 
Um, would you have the real estate for expansion or to accommodate larger numbers of those wider body airplanes? Do we need to acquire more real estate or is the current physical uh, footprint enough to accommodate any future expenditures? And a quick follow up. There's a sweet old lady in Puerto Rico that is missing her son. So if you had more direct flights to San Juan, we would really appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Chair and Counselor, uh, thank you uh, for that. So, um, you know, the, the airport is designed to accommodate the largest, uh, for the most part, the largest aircraft. Now, the, the largest aircraft flying out there really is the Airbus 380. Mm -hmm. And that's that double decker. I don't know if you've seen it. Double decker, uh, four engine, huge uh, aircraft. What's interesting, though, I, and, and so the largest aircraft that we typically see is the Boeing uh, uh, 777, 777. And we can accommodate that aircraft just, just fine. What you're seeing with that Airbus 380 is Airbus has actually, I believe, stopped producing those aircraft because there's, there's the demand is not forthcoming for it. So I think um, it, it works between certain really high density uh, demographic uh, areas, but uh, I just don't see that as a, as a need. Now we've had a 380, I think, in here, and it, uh, so we, we can accommodate it, but if we were to accommodate an aircraft that size on a regular basis, there's considerations we'd have to Uh, we, we'd have to make improvements because the spacing between gates would have to change in certain areas. But typically, um, what I mean, with our international flights or wide body flights, we have wide body gates and then we have narrow body. We, we uh, configure those strategically to maximize the capacity. So we're really not concerned about that. Um, we're well served to being able to serve the Boeing 777 and uh, aircraft of that size and smaller. I don't know if you'd have anything else to add to that. I think that um, what I would add is in our 2010 uh, long-term plan and likely in our upcoming plan would be, as Brian mentioned, an extension to our Concourse G. And that would, that would provide that additional handful of gates and allow us to sort of reallocate space all along the concourse to provide The larger wingspans for the aircraft that we're talking about. We're we're just a we're an emergency landing site basically for an A380 if they get rerouted from Chicago or something. So we can accommodate it, but that's not our design effort. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Stern. Right. Thank you, uh, Chair. <clears throat> I just had you mentioned like some sustainability with the buildings, and I'm just kind of wondering either through observations or direct knowledge between ground transportation and their planes as far as like carbon footprint and fuel efficiency. Is there any development in that either from the airport standpoint or airlines uh, standpoint? Uh, Madam Chair and Councilor Sterner, um, yes, there there is. So we have a sustainability uh, program that we've been engaged in for a number of years. The, the, the MAC Commission adopted a, sustain, a sustainability management plan a couple of years uh, ago. So we're doing a lot of different things from a facility, the solar panels, uh, green roof, uh, electrification in areas that we, uh, we, we can. Um, from an airline perspective, <laughs> the airlines, you're right, the airlines are the major contributors. Uh, I, I think when you look at an airport environment as a, as a whole, the airlines make up about 90, I think it's over 90% of that contribution, obviously. What we have um, done uh, uh, recently, and this, this was announced about a year and a half ago, is uh, something called optimized profile descents. And it has saved tremendously and helped the carbon footprint out quite a bit. What it, what it does is air traffic control procedures used to be as you were coming in as an aircraft or a pilot coming into the airport, they would step you down. So they'd clear you to a certain altitude Then you'd, they'd add power and you'd straighten out. Then you'd, they'd clear you down to another altitude and you'd, you'd add power and straighten out. Coming into Minneapolis now, we worked out with FAA and Delta Airlines and Sun Country Airlines an optimized profile descent so that when you come in now and, and um, monitor this the next time you fly in, um, what you'll see is the, the captain will pull the power back and you'll do a gradual descent all the way, all the way down. And that has saved tremendously from 
fuels. It's a positive for the airlines because they burn less, less fuel. It's a, a real positive for the environment because it's a less uh, emission. So that's one of the, the biggest impacts. But we, we are part of um, a global airport um, carbon accreditation uh, process where we have goals and, um, and we have a criteria to try to meet those goals every year. And, and so we are, we are following that uh, process very, very closely. A lot of discussion. I'm part of a Airports Council International World Governing Board, and there's a tremendous amount of conversation around uh, that uh, currently right now, how we can set enhanced goals moving, moving forward. Europe, the Europe airports are certainly um, very aggressive with it. Um, the, the Asian airports less so, and we're kind of right, right in the middle. So it's a, it's, a, but it's uh, being discussed uh, heavily at the airports across the, across the globe, actually. Thank you, Councilmember Barber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to thank uh, Brian and Bridget for coming out today. I think it was always great to hear all the great things happening um, at the um, in the, the air transportation network. And um, obviously, I'm very interested in it from the transportation perspective here, from the public sector, but also my private sector world. I own a medical device consulting company, and I think we're like the center of the world for medical device um, industry. And a lot of that has to do with the airport and ability to get people in and out. And um, and I do think the hotel is going to be a big, another asset to that, which will be helpful. But um, really, when we look at what really helps make us competitive as a region, I, I do believe that the air network is one of those big things. So really, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate that. Our, our pleasure. Councilmember Fritzen. Thank you, Chair. How does population growth uh, affect commercial capacity? And is there a point where you anticipate reaching capacity at the MSP site? Uh, uh, Madam Chair and, and Councillor, a great question. And I think um, our long-term uh, planning process will help respond to that. I, I think what, what's interesting is when, and you can correct me, I, I wasn't here uh, then, but when you did the 2010 plan, um, we were, from an operational standpoint, we were expecting um, much greater um, annual operations than we're currently experiencing. It's because of the change in the industry from the size of aircraft that I talked about initially. So it's a great question, and we'll be getting into that here in the next uh, in the next year, uh, really determining what, uh, from a demand capacity standpoint, what this this uh, airport can handle. So I don't have honestly a good answer for that right now. Uh, we have, um, I think, we have plenty of capacity for the foreseeable future. Um, but I think the long-term comp plan will answer those, help answer some of those questions. Thank you. you. Councilmember Atlas Ingerbretson. Thank you, Chair. Um, could, and I, I don't anticipate that you'll have this information or to provide it today, but I think it would be wonderful to know about it in the future, what um, exactly the workforce looks like. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, unfortunately, um, while we're one of the most prosperous regions in the country, we also have the highest rates of disparities as it comes to income and quality and employment in particular. Um, so it would just be wonderful to see what does that look like and how um, how uh, is employment shaping up um, at uh, the airports. Mm -hmm. And also with vendor diversity as well, if you have programs for vendor diversity, what that looks like. Um, I work with people who come here from all over the world, but um, and, and the country on a regular basis. And um, they come expecting kind of a certain type of population in Minnesota that is often informed by Garrison Keillor or <laughs> Fargo, the movie, um, with our, which are both wonderful. Well, uh, they're both whatever. Anyhow, um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there isn't a great representation and understanding in many of our spaces of how diverse our area is. Um, and Minneapolis, St. Paul, our metropolitan area, all the surrounding communities are tremendously unique in our nation for diversity. I don't even think we understand how unique we are in that way and how much of an asset and interest that is. So people are often shocked. I think it'd be great to make sure that what they see in our airport is a reflection of our community Absolutely. as it is. And so I'd just <clears throat> love to hear, next time we hear from you, it'd be great to hear about what um, that could look like. Um, I love Blue Door um, and, and other venues like that. Um, the owner cheats at uh, 
Pictionary and other games. Trivia pursuit. But um, so I love them. Great business and would love to see other. Um, I love to see great pho restaurants or Thai restaurants or Ethiopian or Somali restaurants and sure. other communities being able to take advantage in addition to um, wonderful fare that that is has been at the airport or and, and will continue to be going forward. Great, Madam Chair and, and Council, thank you, thank you for that. We do take diversity very uh, seriously, and, and um, from my standpoint, um, you're right. I, I agree. We need to reflect the community, and we, we've um, uh, over the past three years since I've been leading the MAC, I can I can tell you, uh, I inherited all white male workforce, and we now have uh, four, at least four of our senior leadership which is about 11 people are uh, female and, and minorities. So I'm, I'm proud of that. That takes uh, some time, obviously. but um, and, and I'm proud of that because uh, in past positions I've held at other airports, I know and understand how important that diversity is and how it just changes um, really the entire organization and connects the organization. And so that, that, that's really important, and we'd be happy to uh, share with you separately uh, what we currently have going on and, and what our plans are for the future. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a quick comment and a question. Um, we traveled a couple weeks ago with two of our grandchildren, and we stayed at the Intercontinental. We had an early morning flight. It is the slickest thing ever. We didn't want anyone to have to get us to the airport that early. So we stayed overnight. We started our vacation a day early to go through TSA and just walk through that skyway and be there is absolutely the best thing ever. It's wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, my question, and I realize it's very complicated, but can you give us sort of the Reader's Digest version of how do you decide how you're going to, what routes get added, um, both um, and, and uh, within the United States with um, uh, various routes going east and west that they're adding, the Sun Country's adding, and then Aer Lingus. How, how long does that process take and what's the max role in approving an international carrier or anybody else? Yeah, a great question, Madam Chair. Uh, it's, it can be a marathon. I mean, it's like economic development. These resources that airlines are putting into communities are very, very expensive. Um, so there needs to be a, it used to be where an airline could add service and they would wait a year to see if they received a return on that. But it has become so competitive over the last uh, 10 years now that if that route is not performing well, they will pull it pretty quickly within, I mean, within six months uh, in, in some occasions. So, um, so we look at data we get from DOT to see where the demands are. The airlines have network planners where they monitor it very closely as well. But the information that we're bringing forward, I think for us, as I said, it's really uh, the information that we're bringing forward, the forward thinking information that gives airlines a heads up or, um, or you know, validates uh, something that they may have towards the top of their list. So it's been, it's been very important, but it, it can be, it can happen quickly if a new business moves into the region that has a direct tie to some other community, uh, or it can be a longstanding uh, a process where we really have to justify and continually build and develop those relationships with airlines. So it's it's it, it's all over the board. But again, um, it's a very high priority from the airports commission standpoint. We realize what the return on that investment is. And the other thing I'll say that I didn't mention, it's part of the air service development piece. We actually incentivize airlines um, because when, when you have an Aer Lingus that's competing against a Delta, mm -hmm. you know, the 800 pound um, gorilla that's been here for many, many years, that's really tough for them because there's so much brand loyalty. I mean, Sky Miles and, and all of that. So, um, we can do things from an airport like wave landing fees for up to two years, wave gate fees, and that reverts, it can revert to um, a million to two million dollars in savings for an airline to come in here and help get established. And we apply that consistently. So it's not, it's, you know, if Delta wants it, 
they can get it for a new road if uh, Aer Lingus wants it, if British Airways, you know, if we can lure them into here and want it, we, we have to treat them all fairly. But that's kind of how we help incentivize some of that service. But it's, it's really driven by demand, uh, demographic demand, and, and based on business opportunities for the most part. And to some extent, leisure and destination travel as well. We've engaged our leisure and destination um, organizations um, in this development effort as well. Great. Thank you both so much for being here. Very interesting presentation. Thank, thank you. I know um, my uh, VP of Government Affairs and Nick are working on setting up a tour for as many of you that can, and, and I'll tell you, this is the boring part. My presentation was the <laughs> tour is really the fun part because you get behind the scenes out on taxiways and runways. So I know they're working on setting that, that up and uh, you'll thoroughly in, enjoy it. So if you can take part in that, love to have you. Thank, Thank you both so much. Our final item tonight is the presentation on the Clean Water Act presented by Rebecca Flood. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you for being here and presenting. <laughs> Madam Chair and Council Members, my name is Lisa Thompson. I'm the General Manager for Environmental Services. And today we're here to present some information regarding the Clean Water Act. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Rebecca Flood, who has spent 40 years protecting Minnesota's water resources. I think you're in for a real treat because Rebecca's career uh, brings a very unique perspective to this topic. Her first 30 years were spent with this organization and its predecessor doing environmental compliance work for the wastewater treatment plants. In the last 10 years of her career, she worked for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, was an assistant water commissioner, and was responsible for statewide water policy, including the Clean Water Act implementation. So uh, she retired from MPCA a year and a half ago, and we were able to convince her to do a little work in her retirement mode. And uh, with her background and history, we're really benefiting with some of her assistance on some of our projects. So I will turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa and Madam Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today um, and talk about the Clean Water Act. I won't nerd out too much, although I probably <laughs> could. Um, so I'd like to cover a little bit about what led up to the act, what were the problems that we were experiencing as, as a nation, what are the basics of the Clean Water Act, what does it do, and then talk about the state's role in implementing the Clean Water Act. So I kind of like to talk about this first part is how did we awaken to the problems uh, of water quality in our country and in our state uh, to kind of give you that background of how did we get the Clean Water Act and what does it mean. So going back 150 years or more, the, um, as the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul grew, um, they started to clean up backyard privies and unsanitary conditions, and they collected uh, sewage waste from homes and piped it directly out to the river. That's what they did. And it was a really great thing for local residential kind of public health issues. Um, and it worked pretty well um, in as long as the population of Minneapolis and St. Paul stayed small and the river flow just washed the waste downstream. That was okay. But then in 1917, when the Lock and Dam Number 1 was built just downstream of the Ford Dam, it backed up all that sewage right behind it. All that discharge that went directly out in the river uh, landed right behind uh, the Lock and Dams and it became just this festering cesspool. In 1926, the first Mississippi River water quality study was conducted by the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries. Um, and as you can see from this chart, the oxygen levels in the Mississippi River were disastrous. The standard currently is, requires five parts per million of oxygen in the water to support uh, aquatic life. Uh, downstream down near Hastings, almost zero. The rebound that you see there in the chart is due to the influx of clean water from the St. Croix mixing in and, and providing a boost of oxygen before uh, the water gets down to uh, Red Wing. Similarly, coliform bacteria levels uh, were outrageous. The current standard is 126 organisms per 100 milliliters of water, and you can see like we're way beyond that. Um, so 
uh, it, it just was really, really uh, a dramatically bad situation. Also, as a part of that survey in 1926, they set up 125-foot uh, nets in some of the backwater shallow areas um, and, and found three fish in the 50 Mount River stretch. Not three species of fish, but three fish uh, in the river. So, yeah, I saw the eyes widen there. But, yeah, that's what they found there due to this. And this was just severely degraded uh, water quality and low oxygen levels. Hopefully this video works a little bit better, but it's a couple minute video that shows kind of just the general nastiness of the situation. And the situation was so bad that between 1918, when right after that first lock was built, until 1938 when the Metro plant started operation, there were no homes built on the St. Paul side along the river because the smell in the summertime was so absolutely horrid. You can see kind of bubbling, gurgling uh, bubbles of, of gaseous emissions, methane being as the as the waste is decomposing in the river. Wow! You get that kind of uh, bubbling, gurgling masses of of waste that is uh, at this point in 1928. The State Department of Health declares the Mississippi River a public health hazard. It says, do not touch this water. Do not let your animals touch this water. Do not let your cattle drink from this water. It is really, really terrible, not, not suitable for human consumption. Um, and you can kind of see here as, as the video goes on that we have actually children playing uh, in the river, kind of splashing and puddling around uh, in, in the Mississippi River. And so not surprisingly, there was a very large typhoid outbreak in 19, 1935 that happened as a result of that. So as a result of this, um, both public health threat that happened and the fact that really the river was dead from an aquatic life standpoint, um, the Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant was, con and, or formerly known as the Pig's Eye Plant, was constructed, along with the major sewer pipes that conveyed the wastewater uh, from uh, the cities and down into uh, the plant. Uh, it, Construction was initiated in 1933 and completed in 1938. When the plant first opened, it, uh, it had primary treatment and 134 million gallon per day wastewater capacity. It reduced the pollutant load 50% that normally, that, that previously had been going to the river, 50% reduction in pollutant load. So the interceptors in the plant really are our first example of a regional wastewater treatment system because the cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul got together and said, we have to do something better than what's happening currently out in the environment. And water quality responded uh, very positively to the fact that uh, wastewater was now being treated in 1938. But that really didn't last long because of industrial growth and development and population growth after World War II um, and those expansions that wastewater treatment just could not keep pace with those, the industrial development and the population development and maintain uh, and reduce the impact that that was having on our water resources. So as a result, less than 20 years later, uh, there needed to be another upgrade and expansion of the Metro plant. And it was done uh, at a cost of $30 million. So secondary treatment was added uh, as a result of that. And it reduced the pollutants approximately 85 to 90%. Um, so what was previously going out to the river was now being treated at the plant. Secondary treatment improved oxygen levels in the Mississippi River by decomposing that organic matter in the plant rather than that gurgling mass of goo that you saw in, in the video. But as much as the Twin Cities was trying to figure out how to deal with growth and development uh, that was happening, uh, both the population and the industrial sector, so was the rest of the country. And more than anyone else, I would say Rachel Carson, my personal shero, um, <laughs> launched the global environmental movement when she uh, published her seminal book, Silent Spring. Now, this is a book that's about the po how we poisoned ourselves with pesticides, but it really was at the vanguard, the very start of people paying attention to what is happening in our environment. So it really awoke our public in a way that no other book kind of before or since 
has. And when I read it in 1968, it was kind of the light bulb going on for me too in terms of environmental awareness. And I would say then a key visual that came in 1969 that really intensified the public outcry to do something about uh, the degradation of our environment and the impact that we were having on our water resources was the 1969 burning of the Ohio River, pardon me, the Cuyahoga River in, in Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. Prior to that, to 1969, the river had caught fire uh, more than a dozen times. But this is the, the, the time that really galvani galvanized the public's attention to what was going on with our water resources <coughs> in a way that hadn't happened before. The 1969 incident, a term, again, occurred at a time of this growing environmental awareness that was happening within our country. So in response to this growing uh, public pressure to do something uh, about how, what's happening with our water, water resources, President Richard Nixon created the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as a way to kind of assuage this public outcry. This is a picture of the swearing in of the first U.S. EPA administrator, William B. Ruckel's house. Um, but really, the creation of EPA was not enough to assuage the public outcry. Congress had an interest also in addressing water pollution issues. So after two years of negotiation uh, and with the uh, momentum of environmental awakening behind Congress, um, the Clean Water Act was passed over the veto of President Nixon. Um, Minnesota Representative John Blatnick from Duluth was the primary author in the House side, uh, assisted by then lead committee staffer and former Congressman um, Minnesota Jim Oberstar. The Senate efforts were led by Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine, who was also running for president at that time. Debate between the House and the Senate was very intense. Um, I think the Senate really wanted to have an act that created aspirational goals. Um, and the House was really a little bit more cost conscious and pragmatic. They were um, concerned about uh, the potential impact that this would have on those that needed to implement the act. This led to a good bit of uh, negotiation and compromise between uh, the House and Senate. The main reason, pardon me, go back here. The main reason for uh, President Nixon's veto was that he was concerned about the potential cost uh, that this was going to have on both municipal and industrial dischargers to implement the act. And it's really a theme that resonates today. And this is a picture here of President Nixon signing a subsequent Clean Water Act funding bill uh, that came about. The objective and goals of the Clean Water Act are unchanged since its passage in 1972. So it's the objective of the Clean Water Act to restore, maintain the biological, physical, and chemical integrity of our nation's waters. It has two accompanying goals. The first goal is to make all water fishable and swimmable by 1983 and to eliminate the discharge of pollutants by 1985. The act prohibits the discharge of untreated wastewater, including wastewater from combined sewers. Um, combined sewers uh, initially were designed to take both sewage and storm, storm water from our streets. So it mixes together in the, in the storm water and can sometimes, when there's too much rain, lead to overflows of, of untreated wastewater into our, our water bodies. So when it rained in areas that had combined sewers, bad things would result. You know, as a kid, I didn't need to go very far to see the impacts of combined sewage. Um, and I grew up about 25 miles south of Chicago, <coughs> part of the greater Chicago Sanitary District. I could sit at the top of my basement stairs and watch when it was raining, combined sewage backed up into our basement, overflowed into the set tubs, kind of little mini Niagara Falls in the basement, or would gurgle out of the basement floor drain. And nobody felt compelled to pay us to, to clean that up, which is a practice now that happens uh, in the rare or circumstances when there is sewage backs up. Backs up. So it, it, it was something that uh, was a very common thing when I was a kid uh, growing I, up. Can I stop you for one moment, Councilmember Fredson? Oh, I had a question she answered. Go ahead. You, you My question was answered. I was oh. going to ask what he was if he was vetoing the bill or signing some legislation in the bill, you answered it. Thank you. 
I would just like to add, we have black backflow preventers now to keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Adam Pierre, thanks to the plumbers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, let's talk a little bit about what's protected uh, in the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act protects navigable waters, which are waters that either carry or have the potential to carry commercial navigation, including recreational navigation, which is how you draw in some of the smaller uh, tributaries or lakes and connected wetlands uh, into coverage under the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act applies to surface waters it does not protect groundwater specifically. That the Clean Water Act leaves that um, dealing with groundwater up to the provinces of the states. So the states manage groundwater. The Clean Water Act protects, and the Safe Drinking Water Act both protect drinking water. The, the Clean Water Act establishes standards for the protection of our water resources for their use as drinking water. And then the, the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, assures the quality of drinking water at the tap. So both of those um, laws protect our drinking water. The Safe Drinking Water Act has six separate titles, and I want to just highlight three of those permits, standards, and the state revolving loan program. Now, this is when I, I can get a little nerdy here, so stick with me. <laughs> In establishing water quality standards, there are basically three parts to those. First is, what, what are we trying to protect? What's the beneficial use? Do we want to protect that water in order to use it for drinking, aquatic life, aquatic recreation, boating, swimming, uh, irrigation? So those are the uses that we want to protect. And states have the obligation under the Clean Water Act to say, this is how we're going to use this water and this is what we're going to protect. So for example, we want to protect Lake Superior or the Mississippi River for drinking water. The state says that's the use that we want to protect. And then the next part of those are the standards that are needed to protect that use. So we may have more stringent requirements and standards to protect water for use as drinking water than if we were going to use it for uh, agricultural irrigation, as an example. And the third part of this uh, water quality standard is a thing called anti-degradation, which is a process by which we decide how we're going to protect our high quality waters. How are we going to do that? So whenever we issue a permit and there's going to be a degradation, a, a discharge of more pollutants from a permitted source, we have to go through a process to say, we decide that it's okay for us to degrade those uh, high quality waters. So those are the three elements that make up a wa state water quality standard, the use, the actual number itself, and anti-degradation. And then lastly, EPA has an obligation in its oversight role of states to approve the state water quality standards to ensure that they are consistent with the Clean Water Act. Minnesota's initial program for standards and permits was approved by EPA in the summer of 1975 and EPA must approve any new water quality standard that we develop. So for example, we anticipate at some point in the future when uh, research studies are completed that uh, the state will eventually have a new water quality standard for nitrate nitrogen. How do we want to protect our waters from nitrate? Now that standard will go through an extensive process within the state uh, in its development. It will use all the new research uh, and science behind it to develop the numeric number, and then EPA evaluates that to make sure that that's cons that action is consistent with the Clean Water Act. So just to say out loud, we're always going to have new standards. Some people say, well, you know, we're always moving the goalposts, but we learn new things. We didn't know uh, things about polyfluoridated compounds 10 or 15 years ago. We know things now. There are new chemicals that are in use today that will um, someday probably have water quality standards for as we learn how they impact uh, both public health and the environment. Those standards then for what our water resources need are then used to develop wastewater discharge permits. So those permits are called NPDES permits. They're issued to all of our wastewater plants 
and NPDES stands for National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, again, reflecting the goals of the Clean Water Act to eliminate pollutant discharges by 1985. So that, I don't know if they could ever have come up with a name like that today, but um, it, it's, a, it's, it's in common usage now. Um, so that signifies, again, that 1985 goal to eliminate pollution. The PCA looks at, the Pollution Control Agency in the state looks at what the water quality standard is in whatever water is going to be discharged to. It looks at the quality of the wastewater itself. What is the effluent? What are the pollutants that are contained in that effluent? And how much, how much of those pollutants can we allow to be discharged into that waterway and still meet water quality standards? So that's how the, all of our wastewater treatment plants end up with effluent limits in their discharge permits in order to be protective of the water resources. Those permits also require municipalities to control the discharges to their sewer collection systems. We must protect the physical facilities of both the pipes and the plants themselves, as well as make sure that the influent, effluent, and sludge that's generated does not contain toxic chemicals. So we have, we operate an industrial pretreatment program that looks at all of our industries to make sure and, and permits them, we permit those industries to make sure that they aren't sending too many toxic chemicals down to our wastewater plants. Wastewater plants are also required to have a cost recovery system to ensure that they have the financial resources that they need in order to expand and upgrade their uh, treatment plants when they're needed, as well as they're required to have an asset management program that ensures the proper operation and maintenance of both the wastewater collection system as well as the treatment plants. The third title of the Clean Water Act that I want to highlight is the State Revolving Loan Program. So in 1972, when the Clean Water Act was passed, the State Revolving Loan Program helped to pay for um, new or upgraded municipal wastewater improvements. So first, EPA helped to provide capital uh, to get that work done. It was kind of like a Kickstarter program. They came up with the capital for states to grant out to municipalities to do uh, the upgrades and expansions of the plants that were that were needed in order to meet the new requirements of the Clean Water Act. Um, the grants would pay for both design as well as planning and design as well as construction of the plant. So that was a very important aspect that was added to the Clean Water Act. So really for the first 20 years of the Clean Water Act, the federal government provided 75% of the funding for municipalities to upgrade and expand their plants. In the state of Minnesota, Minnesota kicked in another 15% of grant funding. So municipalities only had to pay the remaining 10% by loans. In 1987, that grant program was started to be phased out. So that now municipalities, when they get grants, or when they, when they need to upgrade and expand their facilities, the grants are no longer available. So they have to pay 100% of the cost of those new upgrades. So again, kind of resurfacing that uh, Congressional House and Senate debate between the cost of implementation and the worry that that poses. And this really now, today, really places a lot of stress, particularly on our small and mid-sized communities to pay 100% of those loans back. Um, the Metropolitan Waste Control Commission at the time, and now the Metropolitan Council, they took, we took a lot of advantage of that federal construction grants program and the state month grant money that was provided. And that's one of the reasons why we have such affordable rates now in comparison to both mm. uh, sanitary districts of our size and larger that did not kind of put their blinders on and said, no, we don't want to do this and didn't take advantage of that, that federal money. It's really made it, it still is a lingering effect of taking advantage of those loans that we have mm. very affordable rates here today. So that was a really uh, a lot of forethought uh, done by the leaders of those, that organization then. So let me provide some examples of how the Clean Water Act has been implemented in the metropolitan area through our wastewater NPDES permits. So this slide shows uh, the 35 plants that were in the Twin Cities metropolitan area when the Metropolitan Sewer Board was first formed. Um, Russ Susag, who is a former Metropolitan Council member, 
uh, also was the first director of the sewer board's environmental uh, quality uh, control department. Um, he was, uh, he, when, when the sewer board was formed, he saved the headlines from the newspaper at that time where the headline read, board inherits 35 lemons. So not really good, not star performers in the region. And when he said when he would report on plant performance before the board, that he would report on the number of plants that actually met their effluent limits because it was a much shorter list. So those plants at that time were really struggling to meet, you know, kind of as you saw with, with some of the preceding slides, um, that they were struggling to meet even standard secondary requirements at the time the sewer board was formed. Mm. For example, the Metro plant in 1969, its effluent limit for organic load was 120 parts per million. Its limitation in this permit today is 10. Mm. And they struggled in 1969 to meet the 120. There's no way they could have done 10. So today, 50 years later, we're served by eight regional, regional wastewater treatment plants um, that serve uh, the 109 communities in the metropolitan area, in the seven county metropolitan area. And all of these plants have a greater number of effluent limits and they're dramatically more stringent than the ones that were uh, in the first permits that were issued to those plants. We've made significant progress in the metropolitan area. Metro's first wastewater Minnesota's first wastewater discharge permit was issued to the Metro plant soon after EPA approved uh, the state's program in 1975 as the largest treatment plant. It made sense to issue the first permit to that facility. So then in order to meet the new standards, the new effluent limits that were set out in that permit, there needed to be, the Metro plant needed to go through some additional upgrades and expansions. Because it was struggling to meet its 120 milligram per liter organic load limit, it needed to remove more solids from the wastewater in order to meet its new technology-based limitation. The more solids you have, the more that you have to dispose of. At the time, the Metro plant was constrained. It didn't have enough incineration capacity at the treatment plant. So the first consent decree um, that, that I was involved in with my career when I started in 1978 was to take that extra sludge that was that was removed from the wastewater and land apply it uh, in an interim basis while the metro plant was uh, constructed, uh, providing additional incineration capacity at the plant. So remove that extra solids from the wastewater. We needed to dispose of it. Incinerators were shut down, improved, expanded. So we had to land apply the sewage sludge as its method of disposal. The next major uh, improvement came just five years later in 1983. Minnesota and Wisconsin agreed to separate sewers. There was a, the, the state of Wisconsin sued the, the Metropolitan Waste Control Commission in the state of Minnesota at the time because there were billions of gallons of combined sewage being still being discharged from <coughs> combined sewers. Um, into the Mississippi River and impacting downstream Wisconsin uh, water resources. The Waste Control Commission, the city of Minneapolis and the city of St. Paul and South St. Paul were already on a schedule to separate sewers, but it was like 40 years long. And in this consent decree, we all agreed that we were going to separate sewers and um, achieve that by 1995. So just a mere 12 years later after this consent decree was signed. And I would have to say that this is really what we've done here in the metropolitan area. No other major sanitary district in the United States has done this work, has worked this hard to separate sewers. Uh, you can go to any conference, any environmental conference and hear how um, Milwaukee or Chicago or whatever are pleased when they have maybe 10 or less sewer overflows per year. We have totally eliminated those. We've not had a sewer overflow since 2010. So a lot of work, and, and you should take a lot of pride in the work that uh, the council has done to separate sewers. In 1988, we had a historic drought and low flow in the Mississippi River that led to 
severe <coughs> algal blooms and fish kills in downstream Lake Pepin. And being the largest discharger upstream of Lake Pepin, uh, the state uh, and the Pollution Control Agency look to the Metro plant to address its phosphorus issue, issues. Excess phosphorus cause is a, you know, phosphorus is a fertilizer. It causes excess al algal growth in our uh, lakes and rivers. And that algae, when there's too much of it, as it dies off and settles to the bottom, it starts to decompose. And then you get oxygen is removed from the water in order to decompose that, just like in that uh, 1926 video, uh, 1933 video, you can see the impact of uh, decreased oxygen concentrations <coughs> in the water lead to um, fish kills that you'll also get as a part of that. As a result, um, we developed a, a nation-leading phosphorus reduction strategy. So this is before the time when the, the state did not yet have standards for phosphorus in our water resources, but it did have a general uh, requirement in law that said you can't create these nuisance algal blooms. So we developed a specific strategy that said that we were going to upgrade and expand and remove phosphorus. We were going to remove phosphorus at the time when we upgraded our facilities uh, for expansion. Um, and this approach was actually adopted by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency uh, statewide uh, as they were developing their water quality standards for lakes and streams. The Clean Water Act requires water quality-based effluent limitations to be met by July 1 of 1988. And at that time, we knew that our Blue Lake and Seneca wastewater plants were not going to meet that date. So we entered into a consent decree with the Pollution Control Agency and laid out a schedule that we would achieve that by 1992 at those two facilities. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency didn't like the length of the schedule that we were given, and so they decided to take uh, the Waste Control Commission to court to try to force uh, a more quick action. We ended up shaving about six months off the construction schedule for those upgrades. Now, I kind of think that was a little bit of a a bridge too far, as it were. I, I thought it was maybe a, a waste of federal resources and state resources to do that, but it did lead to one really good thing, I think, and that was to draw attention to the fact that we had infiltration and inflow uh, in our sewer system. And for those of you who don't know, infiltration and inflow is clear water. It's either groundwater or stormwater that gets through cracks and breaks in our pipes and, again, overwhelms our pipes with clean water so that um, we uh, do not adequately treat that sewage or we have sewer line breaks or again, unintended overflows. So it really forced us to look at our infiltration and inflow program and make sure that we had something in place uh, for this, both the cities and the, way, and the Metropolitan Council to reduce the amount of clear water that we were getting into our system. And then regarding mercury, as you know, it's a neurotoxin that can affect women of childbearing age and young children. Mercury can concentrate up the uh, aquatic food chain, so it concentrates in fish. And so if there is contamination of fish, we need to make sure that uh, we limit the number of fish meals for, uh, for, uh, from eating uh, so that we don't, uh, if we can protect those vulnerable populations from mercury concentrations above acceptable levels. And we knew at the time there was really no acceptable treatment alternative to deal with mercury at the end of uh, the, the wastewater plant discharge. So we took a pollution prevention approach. We worked for three years with the Minnesota Dental Association, which was, we uh, uh, did some evaluations and found that they were the largest controllable source of mercury into our system, mercury from dental amalgam. And we worked with them to have a voluntary program where all the dentists in the metropolitan area, as a result of that, now collect their dental amalgam and keep it out of our wastewater so that we can meet our mercury effluent limitations. So I want to leave you with four final thoughts here. Um, our work, we protect public health in the environment each and every day, and you are a big part of that, setting policy for us as we do our work. In the 60s and 70s, our plants were failing to meet even standard secondary treatment. And failing our effluent limits now is, is, is shocking. 
Um, so we've really, really come a long way um, in the 47 years of Clean Water Act implementation. It's, and since, the, I guess, the days of Rivers Ablaze, I'm really glad that we're well past that. So we learn new things. Uh, we learn new things about the chemicals that we use, their impact on public health and the environment, and we will always have um, to do more as standards change, as we learn more. And this is really the scientific method in action. We learn new things, we figure out a solution, and we implement them. Thirdly, we have a large wastewater treatment system. This includes interceptor pipes and pumps and lift stations, as well as the wastewater treatment facilities. This means that we need continued ongoing investment of time and resources to assure proper operation and maintenance, as well as conducting upgrades and rehabilitation and renewal. Fourth, we have an increasing population. Climate change and land use changes means that we're going to have to find creative solutions. Just like we developed regional strategies to deal with phosphorus and mercury, there's going to be new strategies that come about for new issues that you'll be wrestling with in the future. And I just want to say, I guess on a personal note, that I really, I've been asked quite a bit about, am I hopeful for the future? And I would say, actually, actually yes, I am. When you reflect on where we've come over the past 50 years and see where we are in terms of providing municipal wastewater service, we really uh, do an incredible job here. And it gives me the confidence when you look back, sometimes you can kind of see the path forward uh, when you reflect on where you've been. I really think that we have the skills and capabilities to do what needs to be done for the future as we wrestle, wrestle with whatever new issues that we're going to be facing. And I really appreciate the time that you've uh, given me to make the presentation, and I'd be happy to address any questions should you have them. Thank you. Another great presentation. Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I, I think it's great to see how far we've come, because people tend to get a little gloom and doom about the present. And when you look back, and it, the, the one river that started on fire was not the only one. That was the one that got all of the attention. But fire, fires on rivers were common mm -hmm. for a while. And you know to understand that how degraded the environment was and how much we cleaned it up is very important. I also I knew about the the work that we did on the con combined sewer separation. I didn't know that it was the result of a, a lawsuit from Wisconsin, but I find that really ironic given that Milwaukee is one of the poster children for not fixing the problem and they just built a mile long tunnel underground, giant tunnel to hold all of their excess flow until they can process it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, Madam Chair, if I might, you know, it was initially. Uh, the recommendation of the Waste Control Com the Sewer Board and the Waste Control Commission at the time in, in separating sewers to do a deep tunnel approach. They, we, we didn't want to separate it, but the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul thought that that alternative was too expensive and decided we're the ones that pressed for the sewer separation. Well, we're better for it, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh. mm. Council Member Lynn. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll second um, what Councilmember Wolf said, and and um, also I want to let you know I used to work at the Humphrey School with Deb Swackhammer, and I know whenever your name came up, it was like hallowed ground. I mean, it was like she ha holds you in very high regard, and I know she wrote the book uh, on clean water in in many ways, and. Um, second, I wanted to give you a heads up that I'm going to be sending both of you an email uh, probably tomorrow because on behalf of the Met Council, we serve on the um, Environmental Quality Board. Uh, Chair Slavik does, and I'm the alternate. And next week, the EQB has a day-long retreat. And it is about what the EQB should be focusing on in the next year, two years, three years, Etc. And so there's a series of questions uh, that uh, they have sent out um, to the participants that I'd love to get your feedback on what the EQB should be focusing on in, in the near future. So just a little heads up that that's coming your way. 
Excellent. And thanks again for your, your service. Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Thanks. Um, thanks for the informational, um, um, edu well, just the education. I think so. We get a lot of informational presentations. I really appreciate the thoroughness that you provided. I also um, think we're, um, it's not going to be a surprise. I'm always talking about equity, but I think one of the things that is also important is that we talk about succession um, planning and um, how we're bringing new populations into understandings of where we've been. Um, in the review of looking at the history, one of the things I appreciate is that we can be doomed to repeat, maybe not the exact mistake, but different mistakes if we don't stay vigilant and thoughtful and the need to bring other populations into the fold and into positions of understanding. So one of the things I'm wondering about is if your department is taking advantage of any of the internships or um, mentoring opportunities for people who are up and coming in the field. I know that water quality is something that has gained a lot of interest in communities of color, um, indigenous communities, um, in the last couple of years. So I think it's a great time to talk about people joining the career in the field um, as it relates to that because they're inspired and engaged. And so I'm just wondering if you have any interns. I know we have a lot of interns at the council currently. I'm wondering if you have any interns in your department or if that's just something to maybe put a bee in the bonnet for, for something that could happen to take advantage of that momentum and, and bring new folks into the uh, tutelage of such great knowledgeable staff. Madam Chair, that's actually an excellent um, train of thought and we have I think 15 interns in the summer. We uh, have found that to be helpful on both sides so we get some great work done and they come in with a different set of you know different lens and and can help us be a little more innovative sometimes than we would if we come at it from our, our regular ways of looking at things we've also expanded our outreach so we had a grant from our diversity department uh, three years ago i think it was and we added someone to actually help us create a program to go out to high schools to let them know about the work that we do and the great career opportunities. We have jobs that don't require uh, college license or college degrees, and it's great work. But uh, what we found was we've always been pretty under the radar in terms of talking about the work we do, and people really don't want to talk about wastewater or yuck, you know, that kind of reaction. <laughs> but when we've gone out and educated people, and if you've been to one of our plants, you know they're pretty cool. Um, so we've really raised the awareness of this is a pretty good job and a pretty good place to work and it isn't what most people naturally think of when they hear of the subject. So we have um, done a lot of that and we're certainly looking for other ways. In fact, we've had a discussion this week about how we could bring a little bit more programmatic approach to some things we're doing. Sure. Um, what I'd love is, you know, when you have those opportunities, it'd be great for us to know about them and so that we can promote them too. And if you are looking for a thought partner, I'm, I'm, I know myself and I'm sure many others of us are willing to um, make any connections and communities that would be helpful. Madam Chair, one of the things that I'm sure we'll probably do again this year, we always have our interns do kind of a poster board session to talk about their project and what they've done. And um, those have been really well attended and, and the council members have found them to be very interesting. So I'm sure we'll do that, but there could be some other things that we might be also able to do. Thank you. Council Member Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just an observation, um, that video that you show at the beginning of your presentation of the 1930s remind me of, of my grandmother. She had four children and one died in 1940 of cholera mm -hmm. um, in, back in the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico uh, prior to having treated water. Uh, Fifty years later, she was still remembering that child mm -hmm. that she lost because of a purely preventable disease as cholera is. Um, so I think it's important that we realize that's part of the cost of not investing in this system. It's not the cost of the, the infrastructure and the maintenance, but that will save 
an old lady from having to remember a child that died 60 or 50 years before and, and haunted her through the rest of her life. Um, that's part of the cost of not doing the work that we're doing. So it's very, uh, found it interesting that the opposition to the Clean Water Act was about cost instead of the savings of lives. Mm -hmm. but that was my comment, thank you. Excellent. Council Member Sterner. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a couple questions, and uh, yeah. first I want to thank you for your years of service, very uh, fascinating, I was, uh, really enjoyed the information. But my first question was about an OSR sewer treatment plants. We have 35, and most of them are in the south metro area. Why is that, and is that adequate by having them all in the south and uh, one or maybe two of the north uh, side of the Seven County area? You want to catch that? Madam Chair, um, I'm sure there might be some folks that could give a little better answer from a historical perspective, but we do, you know, planning based on capacity needs and planned growth. So we work in, in coordination with what's the region anticipating. And so we've placed them in spots where we could find the land, where we had a discharge location and where the population growth suggested was a good place to put it. Um, some of those that thir original 35, they were discharging to lakes. It's not a good receiving water body. So those were easy when we said, we're gonna get rid of some and we're gonna keep some. And uh, in terms of the uh, Metro plant is our largest. So it takes from a very large area and there's been a lot of benefits to having <coughs> one facility cover that large area because we focus our solids treatment area there and so we can have some of those smaller facilities not have to build that piece into their plants. So it's been part of keeping the affordability um, at the effective rate that it's been. All right, thank you. And then my second question would be is, you know, we're always, like you talk about, there's always something new to look at. We learn more information, but do you have opinions on what the next emergence in the water that you would like to remove out of there? What would be the your top two or three that you would suggest we should be tackling? That's what, um, Madam Chair, Council Members, um, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, in particular with wastewater treatment, about the things that wastewater can't, doesn't inherently remove. Uh, one example of that would be chlorides, for example. So um, the vast majority of, of salts uh, is coming from road salt application in the winter. And we have to kind of balance that with then, and then it, when it runs off, it's impacting our water resources. Wastewater treatment is not specifically designed to remove chlorides. It doesn't, it's a, you know, it's dissolved. It, it's, um, you're not going to remove it with, with uh, an organic process. So that's one of those kind of gnarly issues we need to try to sort through. And, and we're in the process now of, of looking at that, the state of Minnesota, the Pollution Control Agency is also looking at that. And then we just have lots and lots of chemicals in commerce that um, like polyfluoridated compounds and you know, methyl ethyl death and other types of things like that. <laughs> we don't really know or understand the, the impact that that's having on our uh, water resources to the fullest extent. Sometimes it takes a long time for those types of chemicals to um, the impacts of those to express themselves. So I would I would say some of those um, more longer chain organic things like uh, PFCs and, and other compounds, we need to make sure that as a state and as a regional agency participating together with the state that we keep an eye on those types of chemicals. Right. Thank you very much. Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to follow up on Linnea Atlas Ingebrigtsen's comments. Um, that not only do we have interns and are reaching out to young people, but the work that they do is very meaningful work. It's not just busy work. We even have interns that go out to companies and analyze their industrial processes and find ways that they can optimize their process and not use as much water in industrial processes. So it's real world experience that benefits our businesses and customers and benefits the students that are doing the the uh, internships as well. It's a very high demand thing that we're working on expanding if we can because so many communities want that. Councilmember Lindstrom. 
Just to follow up on that, I, I uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I saw that in action on Monday. Monday was my water day, and I, it was a great day. First of all, the weather was amazing. And I spent half the day on the Mississippi River in a boat uh, doing, uh, I, I think, of what a lot of the interns um, do, which is um, I, I hopped in the boat in St. Paul, and we went down all the way down to Hastings, five different um, testing points along the way, and dropped in a device called a Van Dorn, I think it's called. Um, and uh, I learned a ton, and, and it was great to know that, so for, I think it's like 42 weeks out of the year, uh, we have folks out on the rivers and on the lakes doing this water quality testing, um, either in a boat or different spots on land. And uh, it's great to know that this testing, because I was kind of thinking like, you know, is this just like, are all these numbers just sitting, sitting on a shelf someplace or in like the software? But <coughs> I know they're not because they are informing decisions that we are making and that folks at the MPCA are making. Um, and beyond. So, um, for, so, first of all, I just want to thank Tyler, Winter, Dan, uh, Henley, Sam, uh, Paskey for having me on this tour. And I would encourage all of you make sure the day is like 75 degrees, no <laughs> rain in the forecast. <laughs> These folks are going out there I mean, all, in all different uh, weather days. Um, so, uh, but it, it's an amazing tour. And also, uh, I wanted to point out that we have a number of citizen scientists, do we not, that uh, are going out to lakes on a regular basis, probably hundreds of, of them um, that are doing water quality testing uh, as citizen scientists, and I think that's super cool as well. And last but not least, uh, at, since you're here, we have uh, a great event coming up next week where uh, our good work, um, staff's good work, is being recognized at the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, NACWA, where we are going to be receiving the, um, <clears throat> the Gold Excellence in Management Award. And my understanding is they don't just give out the Gold Excellence Award to, to any agency that walks through the door. It's quite um, a prestigious award. So. Uh, kudos to, to, to staff for, for that. And a number of staff are presenting at um, this national conference, which is being held in Minneapolis, which is really cool. And then I also want to put in a plug for July 29th, the, um, the tour that uh, the, the council is invited to participate on to look at different lift stations and interceptor projects and all of these things that have big zeros, uh, lots of zeros uh, <laughs> after them, but as we've just heard, is, is incredibly important. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have two quick comments. The first one is for Council Member Stern. Um, you know, some judge somewhere just ruled that the Roundup Company could be sued for their pesticide, and I've already started seeing lawyers commercials and so that's you know the, the next big chemical, um, and then uh, a couple weeks ago I was uh, at the um, where they took us the Park Service and Wilderness Inquiry took us on the Mississippi and we kayaked um, or canoed down um, from Brooklyn Park to uh, downtown Minneapolis. And as we were getting off on the river in Brooklyn Park, um, we were there was um, at the Carapas Dam. There's a water treatment plant. It was one of the earliest ones. I don't, I don't remember if it's still in use, but they told us that was the one of the earliest um, water plants that served St. Paul. And so, you know, why is why is that facility serving St. Paul in Coon Rapids? This is because it's a harrowing admission of how we used to pollute and abuse our water because, you know, you're upstream and where the water is not yet polluted. Um, but anyway, the point of that quick story is, is to say that thank you for all you guys do and um, in, in, in the ES services, um, and we, we need to toot our own horns more about mm -hmm. how uh, we do good work in community to save our rivers. Any other questions or comments? No? 
Thank I can you. just wait one last comment just is to thank you guys as a body and and the previous council members because your support we wouldn't be what we are today without that because if you look at the situation some of which Rebecca reported and why she has hope for the future is that most of those things were conventional solutions at the time and then as we learned more we decided we had to figure out a different way of approaching that and that's really what we got to do and apply to things today as we learn more information. And sometimes the, the challenge of the conventional approach is the hard part, right? Because people are, we've been doing it this way. And oftentimes it doesn't have that immediate impact where they go, yeah, we got to stop that because that really hurts when we do it. Because you have to have enough data. That's why we've been sampling and keeping an eye on our receiving water. So when things come up, we really know what the story is and we can come up with a good strategy to really resolve it. But we've been supported by the council tremendously with being able to kind of step out on that limb at time and say, we're gonna suggest a different approach because we think long run it'll be better. So thank you for that. Thank you for your presentation and all the work. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair and yep. council members. So that concludes our business. Do any council members have reports? I do. Yes, council members Aaron. Yeah. Um, I want to report something that I'm very proud of. Today, I went to a, a committee meeting. We all, we all wear different hats in our lives, right? Um, and one of my hats that I wear during the day is a part of the Minneapolis uh, Building Trades and Construction, build, Minneapolis Building and Construction Trades. And I'm on a subcommittee there for workforce development. And um, we're trying to bring different communities uh, into the construction fields. And uh, we've, um, I'm very proud of the fact that we've got several different partners that have uh, decided to participate. And I'm going to name some of those now um, Five Skies, uh, Avio, uh, Asian Media Access, and Emerge. Um, they're bringing together a, a an action plan to be able to train people and bring them into uh, the construction field. Uh, and I'm, I'm really proud of uh, the fact that they've got together uh, a, uh, an agenda here to give people personal equity in the job and be able to uh, have a positive effect on, them, on their, their own lives and their families' lives. And, um, but, you know, those aren't, uh, it's great to have a program, but it, unless you got a job for them to go to, right, when the program is done. Uh, so it's important to have th something like the Southwest Light Rail. Uh, and and uh, our staff member, Aaron Kosky, has been working within this program. Uh, shout out to uh, the Sherman and his Associates, uh, Chris Sherman. Uh, he, uh, they're going to use this program as well to give of the folks that run through this program and start to build their skills, a place to actually go work, go to work and apply those skills. And uh, it's important, I think uh, it's important uh, for community healing to be able to have these different cohort, cohorts of folks, you know, lock arms, go through a program yeah, together and then, you know, each one of them will have a choice to make of whether they want to become a laborer, or whether they want to become a bricklayer, or if they want to become an electrician. Uh, and uh, they get an exposure to these different trades. And then on the back side of it, they all get to work together out actually in the field. And that's when, uh, I think that's when the, the healing, the community healings uh, will happen, uh, and it, it's just really powerful. I'm really proud to be be able to wear two different hats uh, as a Met Council and a Building Trades member. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Any other reports? Yes, Council Member Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, I just want to remark on the incident uh, yesterday on North Lindale and West Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually, I worked down on 
uh, West Broadway. So I saw the, the first responders and law enforcement um, getting together when I was on my way to work. And um, I want to congratulate the Metro Transit Police. They were right on the spot uh, right after the incident happened, and they took control of the situation. Uh, with Minneapolis police and also the first responders. So I think that the rap quick action by everyone really helped the situation. Uh, some folks apparently were gravely injured, but the rapid response managed to make a bad situation, not, not get even worse. So just want to make that um, you know, recognition of the, the, the good work from our folks on that particular incident. So thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Yes, Council Member Leak. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, touching on Council Member Allison Gibson's um, question earlier about um, opportunities for younger folks, I know some of us have been contacted by the um, Citizens League uh, because they have a, a new program where um, young uh, leaders uh, from underrepresented communities um, get to kind of talk with officials and uh, government folks about um, the work that we do. And so um, I took on a mentee and I had my first meeting with her Friday evening. And so um, I know they've been going around. And so I uh, look very much look forward to uh, meeting this person and telling them more about the, the great work that we do at the Met Council too. Great. Anyone else? No, seeing none. Regional Administrator Vedas, no. General Counsel Butler. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Sorry, I, I know it's late, but this is an important one. On July 1st, a three-judge panel of the Federal Aid Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in the council's favor in the environmental matter of Lakes and Parks Alliance of Minneapolis versus the Federal Transit Administration. And this is the case that you have all been hearing about in the news for many years. Um, it's coming up on our five-year anniversary in September. So it has been a long haul. Um, contrary to what you might have read, LPA did have this matter reviewed on the merits, and in fact, the federal district judge twice ruled on the merits, and both times had found that the council had not violated the law. The Eighth Circuit, however, didn't need to rule on the merits because it agreed with the council that LPA did not have a private right of action against the council under federal environmental review and also that the court lacked jurisdiction to hear the matter since LPA sued the council before the federal record of decision and did not challenge the FTA's issuance of the ROD. Um, just so you know, LPA has 45 days to file a petition for rehearing or rehearing on banc by the entire Eighth Circuit, and that deadline is August 15th. So we'll be waiting for that deadline, and then this matter may be closed at that time. That's good news. Thank you. Anything else? If there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned.